you know any other styles? I am very grateful. Are you ready? I'm ready. A few weeks ago on Twitter, as one does, I had a run-in with a group of London black cab drivers. If you didn't know, the London Taxi Drivers Union, who have had a monopoly on ply-for-hire taxi trade in London for decades, successfully ran Uber out of town by removing their licence, backed, of course, by that champion of social justice, Sadiq Khan, and, of course, the virulently anti-business Guardian and its readers. Now, much of this discussion on Twitter revolved around the question of whether or not black cabs are effectively a monopoly. The drivers seem to think that because potentially anyone can do the knowledge, which is a test on all the streets of London, you have to pass to get a license, it can't possibly be a monopoly. And also because private hire minicab firms exist. Of course, I got them to admit that since no one else is allowed to ply the streets looking for trade in a taxi, or, for example, wait outside a train station, then effectively they don't have any real competition. I also got them to admit that there is a price fix across the city since all black cabs charge the same fares. So a customer wanting to hail a cab in London can only choose between different black cabs which all charge the same fares. That sounds like a monopoly to me. Now what was most striking through all of my discussions with the black cabbies however was how none of them uh, could seem to comprehend the idea of competition from a new upstart like Uber. To them Uber were not competing they were guilty of predatory pricing and the fact that their prices aren't fixed but indeed fluctuate with supply and demand is not them being responsive to market forces it is rather them manipulating prices. In fact, they jumped through whatever hoops they could in order to avoid facing basic reality. The problem with Uber is a health and safety issue. The problem with Uber is predatory pricing. The problem with Uber is that they exploit their drivers. The problem with Uber is that they manipulate prices. Of course, the real problem with Uber is that they are giving customers a service that they want at a price point they want. The basic reality is that new GPS technology has superseded the knowledge. The USP of the London cabbies, which was giving people what they wanted two or three decades ago, is now outmoded and overpriced. Anyway, this situation with the London cabbies and Uber is the tale of pretty much every labour union. Unions have persistent features which I'll list here. They are fiercely anti-competition. They try to claim exclusive rights to a given job for its members. They try to protect their own potential job losses by denying that work to others. They aim to inflate wages above market value. They are anti-innovation and anti-new technology. They often gain the support of the media and the public through sob stories. And the net result of all of this is less choice for customers at higher prices. And another net result of all of this is that more jobs are lost than if competition and innovation were embraced in the first place. Now one reason for the persistence of these erroneous beliefs about jobs peddled by unions and their supporters who are all deeply ignorant of economics is because they think only of their immediate circumstances. I want to take you through a couple of other examples. Let us take the elevator operator. This was once the job for many thousands of people. And of course there was, and it turns out there still is, an elevator operator union. According to this pro-union puff piece printed in the New York edition of The Observer only last year, a union operator costs around $85,000 a year. Multiply that uh, by the four and a half staff members needed to run an effort elevator around the clock and you're laying out more than $380,000 a year to run one elevator. Now, clearly no matter which way one slices it or tries to puff it up, pushing buttons in a bloody lift is not an 85 grand a year job. And of course, it has been inflated to such a ridiculous degree by none other than unions. And now something which was an everyday job has been 
automated practically out of existence and those lucky enough to get a job as an elevator operator do so only for the utmost elites of society. One wonders if it had remained at market rates whether this might have happened as quickly as it did. Here we can see a union that had a very large hand in accelerating the demise of its own employment market. Because this is what unions often mean. It's fantastic for those lucky enough to have a job, but for all those priced out and left unemployed, the real minimum wage is zero. And so long as it is cheaper for firms to automate their elevators than have someone operate them, the elevator operator will go the way of the dodo. Another example, and one which the latte quaffing, chattering classes love to get all teary-eyed, nostalgic and romantic about, is the cinema projectionist. A job which had a union comprising many thousands of members at one time, but which now, like the elevator operator, is struggling for its own survival. Here in the UK, this has been something pushed strongly by the sneering leftist Elvis-haired film critic Mark Commode, who devoted some time to the topic in his book The Good, The Bad and The Multiplex, in which he takes movie studios and cinema chains to task for considering themselves more with the bottom lines of their own companies than with making and showing the sorts of films that Dr. Commode enjoys. Partly as the result of such efforts, one will see dozens of sob story articles such as this one from Slate.com. Of course, they don't speak to anyone from the film industry in charge of making real business decisions. Instead, they speak to a cinema projectionist who happens also to be a union leader. And of course, it's a big pity story about how projectionists are now expected to run 14 screens at the same time, as opposed to just one. The benefits, efficiency and cost savings of the digital technology making all of this possible are naturally skirted over until Slate get to the real point they want to make. Yes, of course, it's bad old capitalism, alienating everyone and making life worse again. Except, of course, that's complete bollocks, isn't it? As labour productivity has increased, so wages have increased, and so our standard of living has also increased. Clueless leftists such as those hacks who write for Slate never seem able to acknowledge this fact. So, what has gone wrong? Why are the media and the public alike so clueless as to the pros and cons of unions? Let us see what the Bible has to say on this matter. At any given time, a protective tariff or other import restriction may provide immediate relief to a particular industry and thus gain the political and financial support of corporations and labour unions in that industry. But like many political beliefs, it comes at the expense of others who may not be as organised, as visible or as vocal. When the number of jobs in the American steel industry fell from 300 and 40,000 to 125,000 during the decade of the 1980s, that had a devastating impact and was big economic and political news. It also led to a variety of laws and regulations designed to reduce the amount of steel imported into the country that competed with domestically produced steel. Of course, this reduction in supply led to higher steel prices within the United States and therefore higher costs for all the American industries that were manufacturing products made of steel, which range from automobiles to oil rigs. All these products made of steel were now at a disadvantage in competing with similar foreign-made products, both within the United States and in international markets. It has been estimated that the steel tariffs produced $240 million in additional profits to the steel companies and saved 5,000 jobs in the steel industry. At the same time, those American industries that manufacture products made from this artificially more expensive steel lost an estimated $600 million in profits and 26,000 jobs as a result of the steel tariffs. In other words, both American industry and American workers as a whole were worse off on net balance as a result of the import restrictions on steel. 
Similarly, a study of restrictions on the importation of sugar into the United States indicated that while it saved jobs in the sugar industry, it cost three times as many jobs in the confection industry because of the high cost of the sugar used in making confections. Some American firms relocated to Canada and Mexico because sugar costs were lower in both countries. Free trade may have wide support among economists, but its support among the public at large is considerably less. An international poll conducted by The Economist magazine found more people in favour of protectionism than of free trade in Britain, France, Italy, Australia, Russia and the United States. Part of the reason is that the public has no idea how much protectionism costs and how little net benefit it produces. It has been estimated that all the protectionism in the European Union countries put together saves no more than a grand total of 200,000 jobs at a cost of $43 billion. That works out to be about $250,000 a year for each job saved. In other words, if the European Union permitted 100% free international trade, every worker who lost his job as a result of foreign competition could be paid $100,000 a year in compensation and the European Union countries would still come out ahead. <laughs> Alternatively, of course, the displaced workers could simply go and find other jobs. Whatever losses they might encounter in the process do not begin to compare with the staggering costs of keeping them working where they are. That is, because the costs are not simply their salaries, but the even larger costs of producing in less efficient ways, using up scarce resources that would be more productive elsewhere. In other words, what the consumers lose greatly exceeds what the workers gain, making the society as a whole worse off. Another reason for public support of protectionism is that many economists do not bother to answer either the special interests or those who oppose free trade for ideological reasons. The arguments of both have been essentially refuted centuries ago and are now regarded within the economics profession as beneath consideration. For example, as far back as 1828, British economist Nassau W. Senior wrote, high wages instead of preventing our manufacturers from competing with foreign countries are in fact a necessary consequence of the very cause which enables us to compete with them, namely the superior productiveness of English labour. But economists' disdain for long refuted fallacies has only allowed vehement and articulate spokesmen to have a more or less free hand to monopolise public opinion which seldom hears more than one side of the issue. And I think I showed that with the articles from uh, Slate.com. Legendary Labour leader John L. Lewis, head of the United Mine Workers from 1920 to 1960, was enormously successful in winning higher pay for his union's members. However, an economist also called him the world's greatest oil salesman, because the resulting higher price of coal and the disruptions in its production due to numerous strikes caused many users of coal to switch to using oil instead. This, of course, reduced employment in the coal industry. By the 1960s, declining employment in the coal industry left many mining communities economically stricken, and some became virtual ghost towns. Media stories of their plight seldom connected their current woes with the former glory days of John L. Lewis. In fairness to Lewis, he made a conscious decision that it would be better to have fewer miners doing dangerous work underground and more heavy machinery down there, since machinery could not be killed by cave-ins, explosions and other hazards of mining. To the public at large, however, these and other trade-offs were largely unknown. Many simply cheered at what Lewis had done to improve the wages of miners and years later were compassionate towards the decline of mining communities but made little or no connection between the two things. Yet what was involved was one of the simplest and most basic principles of economics, that less is demanded at a higher price than at a lower price. That principle applies whether considering the price of coal or the labour of mine workers or anything else. Very similar trends emerged in the automobile industry, where the danger factor was not what it was in mining. 
Here, the United Automobile Workers Union was also very successful in getting higher pay, more job security and more favourable work rules for its members. In the long run, however, all these additional costs raised the price of automobiles and made American cars less competitive with the Japanese and other cars, not only in the United States, but in markets around the world. As of 1950, the United States produced three quarters of all the cars in the world and Japan produced less than 1% of what Americans produced. 20 years later, Japan was producing almost two-thirds as many automobiles as in the United States and 10 years after that, more automobiles. By 1990, one-third of the cars sold within the United States were Japanese. In a number of years since then, more Honda Accords or Toyota Camiris were sold in the United States than any car made by any American car company. All this of course had its effect on employment. By 1990 the numbers of jobs in the American automobile industry was 200,000 less than it had been in 1979. Political pressures on Japan to voluntarily limit its export of cars to the United States led to the creation of Japanese automobile manufacturing plants in the United States itself, hiring American workers to replace the lost imports. By the early 1990s, these transplanted Japanese factories were producing as many cars as were being exported to the United States from Japan, and by 2007, 63% of Japanese cars sold in the United States were manufactured within the United States. Many of these transplanted Japanese car companies had workforces that were non-union and which rejected unionization when votes were taken among the employees in secret ballot elections conducted by the government. The net result by the early 21st century was that Detroit automakers were laying off workers by the thousands, while Toyota was hiring American workers by the thousands. So I think Thomas Sowell in Basic Economics answers many of the questions that you may have had about this topic, but such is the persistence of the complete balderdash around unions that I must leave even Sowell behind here in order to further debunk them. I must turn to some old scriptures. I have referred to various union makework and featherbed practices. These practices, and the public toleration of them, spring from the same fundamental fallacy as the fear of machines. This is the belief that a more efficient way of doing things destroys jobs, and its necessary corollary that a less efficient way of doing it creates them. Allied to this fallacy is the belief that there is a fixed amount of work to be done in the world and that if we cannot add to this work by thinking up more cumbersome ways of doing it, at least we can think of devices for spreading it around among as large a number of people as possible. This error lies behind the minute subdivision of labour upon which unions insist. In the building trades in large cities, the subdivision is notorious. Bricklayers are not allowed to use the stones for a chimney. That is the special work of stonemasons. An electrician cannot rip out a board to fix a connection and put it back again. That is the special job, no matter how simple it may be, of the carpenters. A plumber will not remove or put back a tile incident to fixing a leak in the shower. That is the job of the tile setter and so on and so forth. Furious jurisdictional strikes are fought among unions for the exclusive right to do certain types of borderline jobs. In a statement prepared by the American Railroads for the Attorney General's Committee on Administrative Procedure, the roads gave innumerable examples in which the National Railroad Adjustment Board had decided that each separate operation on the railroad, no matter how minute, such as the taking over of a telephone or spiking or unspiking a switch is so far an exclusive property of a particular class of employee that if an employee of another class in the course of his regular duties performs such operations he must not only be paid an extra day's wages for doing so but at the same time the followed or unemployed members of the class held to be entitled to perform the operation must be paid a day's wages 
for not having been called upon to perform it. I mean, fucking madness. It beggars belief that anyone ever thought like this, and yet people who believe these very things are living next door to you, dear viewer, at this very moment. Indeed, you may even be living with someone who believes these things. Maybe even you yourself believe them until you watch this video. How else can we account for the sheer number of Bernie bros and Corbynistas in our midst? Anyway, that brings me to a second erroneous belief that Henry Hazlitt, like a white knight of economics, strikes down. The idea that unions are responsible for wages increasing. And here is Hazlitt once again. The belief that labour unions can substantially raise real wages over the long run and for the whole working population is one of the great delusions of the present age. This delusion is mainly the result of failure to recognise that wages are basically determined by labour productivity. It is for this reason, for example, that wages in the United States were incomparably higher than wages in England and Germany, all during the decades when the labour movement in the latter two countries was far more advanced. In spite of overwhelming evidence that labour productivity is the fundamental determinant of wages, the conclusion is usually forgotten or derided by labour union leaders and by that large group of economic writers who seek a reputation as liberals by parroting them. But this conclusion does not rest on the assumption, as they suppose, that employers are uniformly kind and generous men eager to do what is right. It rests on the very different assumption that the individual employer is eager to increase his own profits to the maximum. If people are willing to work for less than they really are worth to him, why should he not take the fullest advantage of this? Why should he not prefer, for example, to make one dollar a week out of a workman rather than see some other employer make two dollars a week out of him? And as long as this situation exists, there will be a tendency for employers to bid workers up to their full economic worth. It is easy, as experience has proved, for unions, particularly with the help of one-sided labour legislation which puts compulsion solely on employers to go beyond their legitimate functions, to act irresponsibly and to embrace short-sighted and antisocial policies. They do this, for example, whenever they seek to fix the wages of their members above their real market worth. Such an attempt always brings about unemployment the arrangement can be made to stick, in fact, only by some form of intimidation or coercion. One device consists in restricting the membership of the union on some other basis than that of proved competence or skill. This restriction may take many forms. It may consist in charging new workers excessive initiation fees, in arbitrary membership qualifications, in discrimination, open or concealed on the grounds of religion, race or sex, in some absolute limitation on the number of members, or an exclusion by force if necessary, not only of the products of non-union labour, but of the products even of affiliated unions in other states or cities. The most obvious case in which intimidation and force are used to put or keep the wages of a particular union above the real market worth of its members' services is that of a strike. A peaceful strike is possible. To the extent that it remains peaceful, it is a legitimate labour weapon, even though it is one that should be used rarely and as a last resort. If his workers, as a body, withhold their labour, they may bring a stubborn employer who has been underpaying them to his senses. He may find that he is unable to replace these workers with workers equally good who are willing to accept the wage that the former have now rejected. But the moment workers have to use intimidation or violence to enforce their demands, the moment they use mass picketing to prevent any of the old workers from continuing at their old jobs, or to prevent the employer from hiring new permanent workers to take their places, their case becomes suspect, for the pickets are really being used not primarily against the employer, but against other workers. These other workers are willing to take the jobs that the old employees have vacated and at the wages that the old employees now reject. The fact proves that the other alternatives open to the new workers are not as good as those that the old employers have refused. 
if, therefore, the old employers succeed by force in preventing new workers from taking their place, they prevent these new workers from choosing the best alternative open to them, and force them to take something worse. The strikers are therefore insisting on a position of privilege, and are using force to maintain this privileged position against other workers. If the foregoing analysis is correct, the indiscriminate hatred of the strike bearer is not justified. If the strike bearers consist merely of professional thugs who themselves threaten violence or who cannot, in fact, do the work, or if they are being paid a temporarily higher rate solely for the purpose of making a pretense of carrying on until the old workers are frightened back to work at the old rates, the hatred may be warranted. But if they are, in fact, merely men and women who are looking for permanent jobs and willing to accept them at the old rate than they are workers who would be shoved into worse jobs than these in order to enable the striking workers to enjoy better ones and this superior position for the old employees could continue to be maintained in fact only by the ever present threat of force. And a very good example of this is the London Underground, where a London trade driver is paid in excess of 50 grand because they bring London to a standstill whenever they want a pay rise. Clearly that job is not worth that. It is vastly above market rates. And in order to maintain that, what they do is they restrict the number of new people who can potentially become a train driver. Uh, they only advertise the jobs internally. So what they do is they artificially limit the supply of potential new train drivers, thereby pushing up demand for their existing services. It is a protection racket. It is exactly what Hazlitt describes. But even still, some of you might be thinking, ah, but surely unions have improved working conditions. At least give them that, academic agent. To disavow ourselves of this pernicious notion, we must go back to Ludwig von Mises himself, although I will do it through a conduit of his, Thomas Di Lorenzo. The shorter work week is entirely a capitalist invention. As capital investment caused the marginal productivity of labour to increase over time, less labour was required to produce the same levels of output. As competition became more intense, Many employers competed for the best employees by offering both better pay and shorter hours. Those who did not offer shorter work weeks were compelled by the forces of competition to offer higher compensating wages or become uncompetitive in the labour market. Capitalist competition is also why child labour has all but disappeared, despite unionist claims to the contrary. Young people originally left the farms to work in harsh factory conditions because it was a matter of survival for them and their families. But as workers became better paid, thanks to capital investment and subsequent productivity improvements, more and more people could afford to keep their children at home and in school. Union-backed legislation prohibiting child labour came after the decline in child labour had already begun. Moreover, child labour laws have always been protectionist and aimed at depriving young people of the opportunity to work. Since child labour sometimes competes with unionised labour, unions have long sought to use the power of the state to deprive young people of the right to work. In the third world today, the alternative to child labour is all too often begging, prostitution, crime or starvation. Unions absurdly proclaim to be taking the moral high ground by advocating protectionist policies that inevitably lead to these consequences. Unions also boast of having championed safety regulation by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration over the past three decades. The American workplace has indeed become safer over the past century, but this was also due to the forces of competitive capitalism, not union-backed regulation. An unsafe or dangerous workplace is costly to employers because they must pay a compensating difference, that is a higher wage, to attract workers. Employers therefore have powerful financial interest in improving workplace safety, especially in manufacturing industries where wages often comprise the majority of total costs. 
In addition, employers must bear the costs of lost work, retraining new employees and government-imposed workmen's compensation whenever there is an accident on the job, not to mention the threat of lawsuits. Investment in technology from air-conditioned farm tractors to the robots used in automobile factories have also made the American workplace safer. But unions have often opposed such technology with the Luddite argument that it destroys jobs. I think I'll leave it there. The problem with unions is that they stand against innovation, technology and progress. The problem with unions is that they sue for special privileges for their own members at the expense of everyone else in society. The problem with unions is that they end up destroying jobs, not only the jobs of those who aim to compete with them, but also, in the long run, the jobs of their own membership. The problem with unions is that, because of their absurd refusal to confront basic realities, economic and otherwise, they are responsible for endemic inefficiencies that end up costing everyday men and women, that is me, that is you, billions of dollars, pounds and shekels, whenever and wherever they are allowed to take root. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Son of Tiamat, Cult of the Lich, Charles Vinson and Edward Dara. Till next time. <laughs>